Hi everybody, my name's Ron Rogers and I'm going to tell you about an airplane with those dreaded propellers. Now as we all know, uh, people are scared to death of propellers. They think that means it's a really, really crappy airplane, uh, dangerous and stuff like that. And of course, as uh, pilots know, that's not true at all. The turboprop uh, works very well on the 400 mile uh, and shorter stage di uh, distance. And uh, oh, by the way, I want to I want to thank all the uh, the people who make comments, and I just absolutely love it. I love the community. I love answering your comments. So keep them coming. And if I make any mistakes in this, which I probably will, let me know. <laughs> I appreciate it. You keep me honest. But okay, I first flew the Dornier 328. Uh, in Munich back in uh, 1994, in October. And um, I'm, I'm going to tell you about that. I also flew the jet version. And I'm going to tell you about that experience because it's kind of interesting. You know, you got this prop version and there was such a feeling of props were terrible. And of course, you know, they've, now they've virtually all gone away for the, mo for the most part. Uh, but this was a beautifully designed aircraft. Okay, it was the Daimler Benz uh, company over there in Ubenhofenhofen, a uh, uh, little base outside of Munich. Now, this had been a base in World War II that was used by the Luftwaffe to defend uh, Munich. And that in itself was an interesting story. Now, I, at the time, was not a world traveler. I uh, got a ride over uh, on Delta uh, to Munich because United at the time didn't serve uh, Munich. And I'm, I'm a fairly young still airline pilot. I don't know much about international travel. And boy, am I impressed with the class act Delta had. And I'm, you know, I, I thought international and domestic was the same thing, kind of, you know, international is just farther, right? No, not quite. And I'm going, boy, these guys put on a class act because that was, I, I didn't have much experience flying on, you know, the other brands uh, like Delta and that. So I'm going, boy, this is a class act and the the captain really took care of the crew, and, and I was impressed. And Munich is a, just a neat city. That Hey, I'm digressing. That um, uh, uh, Deutschland Museum there, world-class museum down on the river. I, st I stayed at the Hilton just up the river, and that later became our, our uh, uh, crew labor ho hotel when United started flying there, and I flew there uh, many times on United. But uh, one other experience, uh, United at the time when I was going uh, to these international sites and doing flight evaluations didn't have really an international presence. So I, I get a, on a flight on American to go to Paris. And like I said, I didn't know that first class was different. And I, and I was sitting back in coach and uh, this flight attendant found out that I was um, a, uh, uh, an employee, airline employee, a pilot, and uh, they had an oversold condition in back. So they wanted to move some people to first class. And she said, would you like to come up to first class? And I go, sure. So I come up there, I sit down, I get a glass of champagne and I'm going, oh, wow. American really know American first class is unbelievable. We're, they're going to eat our shorts here. Well, I didn't realize that, you know, international first class was a, a little bit better, but I digress. But I got another digression too, because going to Munich for the first time was kind of interesting. Now it's, uh, the, uh, the Dornier was, uh, owned by, it's a Daimler Benz consortium. So we're, we're talking Mercedes Benz, you know, the people with the cars and that. And every morning, uh, this German, uh, uh, chauffeur would come to the Hilton hotel and pick me up and take me out to the, uh, the factory there. I think it's Southwest of town at, uh, Oberhofenhofen. And, and I don't know how to pronounce it. It's, you know, how they string these long words together, but, um, he would pick me up and we would go out there and it was a good, it was a good drive. And uh, we kind of got to be uh, friends over the course of this thing because it was a good number of days that he picked me up. And uh, I said, you know, um, I, I, my uh, my boss, when I was back in the Air Force, he had a Mercedes too, but it was a, it, it was a lot smaller. And in Europe, you know, I, I know things are small and this is a big car. I expected, you know, uh, you guys had this, the small Mercedes like I saw around and he kind of, I, I see him in the rear view mirror kind of looking back and smiling, you know, and he goes, uh, you know, we'd, like I said, we'd, we'd chit chat and stuff. We'd kind of got to know each other and he, he kind of laughs and he says, oh, you Americans, you drive the housewife's car. This is a Mercedes. <laughs> so that was fun. Anyway, we got to, we, we got to know each other and he had been about 
four or five years old during World War II, and he talked about um, they would put plates down in the fields and the, uh, the, the troopers would march on them with their boots to make a big racket and about how Hitler was talking and talk about the bombing and stuff and how he experiences as a kid. But anyway, okay, we're going out to the airfield out there. And I'm in the president's office and we're talking about, you know, various things in the airplanes and stuff like that. And, and I don't have a copy of the exact picture he had on the wall, but it was a big picture. And I'm looking at it and I'm seeing these airplanes all around the runways. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but it keeps getting my eye, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm looking up there and finally he starts to kind of chuckle and he says, uh, Oh yeah, that was a that was a Luftwaffe base that um, provided uh, uh, air coverage uh, against the uh, the Allied uh, bombers and aircraft uh, to protect Munich. And he says, you know, a lot of those uh, Focke-Wulf 190s uh, and and 109s are actually buried out there. They just bulldozed over them. And that was interesting. And and, and like I said, I kind of got to be friends with the driver. And he says uh, they had had the uh, the uh, um, uh, Olympics out there at Munich uh, earlier, and he, he, he gave me quite a tour of the city uh, that I hadn't seen before. And that was nice. He took me up around uh, there and that. Okay, I have completely digressed here, uh, so let's get into the subject, the Dornier 328. Now, like I said, and I'm uh, attaching the article uh, down uh, there in the uh, the remarks so you can uh, you can download a PDF of this thing. But this aircraft, you talk, I mean, this was Mercedes-Benz fit and finish. You know, I'm a Chevy guy, Ford. Well, more Ford. Yeah, a little bit of both. Uh, wife's family was Chevy. My dad was Ford. So we kind of integrated, you know, that's why I got a Corvette and an F-150. Okay, but I digress. Anyway, uh, the fit and finish on this thing was nothing like I'd seen. This was an absolutely beautiful aircraft. And the um, the autopilot and the flight systems it's a prime it's a Honeywell Primus 2000 and that's actually uh, when I flew the Dornier 328 jet I went out to a Phoenix at the Honeywell facility out there uh, they had the aircraft in there for a lot of avionics work and that's when I got a chance to fly it but this is about a 30 to 37 passenger aircraft about 2,000 pounds uh, uh, shaft uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 2180 shaft horsepower on the engines. It's in the, the smaller class of turboprops uh, compared to the Dash 8, Dash 400, which I flew later and I'll talk about. But it is a uh, obviously a very uh, decent airplane and it fits a, a, a niche very well. And it has a lot of really nice uh, features, like uh, if you set the V-speeds but the configuration isn't proper, uh, there'll be an amber. If you miss things on the checklist, and I, I talk about this in detail in the article, um, that uh, it, it lets you know that, that things are kind of screw up. Uh, the one thing interesting is it doesn't have an auto throttle system. That kind of surprised me because later on I did a um, single engine uh, approach using just the standby instruments. And uh, I, I actually, uh, we divided it, me and the test pilot. I flew uh, off the standby instruments and he controlled the throttle for the airspeed because that, that cross check would have been a little more difficult. But this airplane was absolutely beautiful as far as handling characteristics well harmonized they worked very well to harmonize the controls it's kind of light for the feel of its aircraft in this class on the controls kind of light on the controls but they were very well harmonized and um, it, it does a few funny things like uh, it was noisy uh, without headsets uh, on takeoff power but it quieted down and um, it used, uh, of course, it doesn't have a big source of bleed air, so it used boots, kind of like on, on my 310. And one thing that was uh, kind of interesting is, uh, and, I, and I'm rather sensitive to this, is on uh, flap um, extension and, and retraction. Because uh, on a 310, boy, you put that first 15 degrees uh, notch of flaps down, and the thing balloons like hell. And, and this thing did it too. I was at 200 knots. And we went to the first flap setting, and it ballooned quite a bit. Now, the reason I'm rather sensitive to this, and, and I talk about this in another video when I talk about a guy named Ed Merkel. He was an aerodynamicist. We were both Air Force fighter pilots together, but Ed, uh, we both worked at Cessna and Boeing together. And Ed was an aerodynamicist. I was in flight test. And he did the design on the Cessna 303 Crusader. And when you put the gear and flaps down, there is no pitch change. 
I mean, it, it's truly amazing how, um, how well that aircraft uh, flies. Um, you know, but the, the one thing about this that the pilots had to say, and uh, one thing they really appreciated was how well the aircraft was designed and the fact that it reduced pilot workload greatly. And uh, as far as turboprop aircraft go, it was quite quiet for the crew. And you know how uh, it is for the, the commuter airline pilots flying these. I mean, uh, they get to see the front you know, six, seven, eight times a day, back and forth, back and forth. It's a lot of work. You know, you, uh, you know, I had, I had the retirement job, the triple seven flying internationally. It doesn't get better than that. You know, a lot of guys talk about, uh, oh, they'll get a retirement job with net jets and uh, no, 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 no. That's work. Uh, you fly the, the triple seven internationally as a senior captain, that's your retirement job because it is just a piece of cake. But we did a lot of things in this, and you can, you can read about it. Um, we flew uh, a lot of approaches. We flew missed approaches. We did simulated engine failures and, uh, and all sorts of stuff. But there is the steely-eyed aviator uh, with a lot uh, darker hair. That, that's blonde hair, but it's, uh, it's darker. But that's me back in uh, 94. And the one nice thing about it, you know, with the heads-up display, I mean, I absolutely love heads-up display where you get all the nice instrumentation. You can look uh, right through it to the runway in low-visibility approaches, uh, just like you can on a number of these aircraft. There's a lot of these, um, you know, uh, regional aircraft. I guess they don't call them commuter anymore. Uh, regional aircraft that uh, are just really well-built. And here is the cockpit layout. I mean, this thing is absolutely beautiful. It was a pleasure to fly, and uh, we had just a perfect day to fly. And there's some of the specifics uh, for you uh, that you can take a look at um, in detail. Uh, I'm not going to list them all here, but uh, that, that gives you a lot of information on various details about the, uh, the, the parameters of the aircraft. And there's a few more things. Now, these these are still kind of preliminary, uh, preliminary data, and uh, some of it is marketing. So um, it's, it's probably near the fact of what the aircraft uh, later developed. But anyway, this was a really superb aircraft. So, uh, like I said, I love your comments. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe. I've been told I've not been saying that, and I should say it. So if you like the channel, subscribe to it. I got a, a lot of... Uh, uh, but people tell me are very interesting uh, videos, so go ahead and take a look. Uh, and like I said, I enjoy your comments. I enjoy the community. And if I got anything wrong here, I'm sure the guys and gals who flew this airplane will certainly let me know. So thanks a lot for watching. I appreciate it. Take care.